Welcome to the WWE Podcast. The most passionate and authentic wrestling analysis on the web. We've got you covered with every Raw, SmackDown, and NXT show. Giving you a no bullshit opinion. We know you love wrestling. We do too. So let's get this show underway. And that's the bottom line. What? Because Stone Cold said so. Hey guys, what's going on and welcome back to another edition of WWE Rivalries and it is November uh, 20th, Friday November 20th that is, as we are just two days away from Survivor Series and man oh man, is the WWE season not flying? It is just crazy that we we are already at Survivor Series, then in a month or so we have a quick stop at TLC. And then sooner rather than later, we are going to be getting ready for the Royal Rumble. And we all know what that means. That means that WWE is in full WrestleMania season. Hopefully, we're back in fans in some capacity by WrestleMania. But I got to say, if we're if we're being honest here, I think we're about uh, another eight months away before WWE gets back in front of fans. So... At least for me, maybe it's a bit premature, but I'm gearing up for yet another WrestleMania in front of nobody. But uh, on a bit of a positive note, I do really like the Thunderdome as opposed to the Performance Center or the Capital Wrestling Center, whatever they're calling it now. So at least the the Thunderdome gives the ambiance as if they're in a real crowd, in front of a real crowd, and they have you know the stage and the setup. They could use some pyro as opposed to the Performance Center. So, at least at bare minimum, we'll get to have it in front of it uh, in the Thunderdome as opposed to the Performance Center. But uh, this week on WWE Rivalries, a very special episode as we are going to recap the rivalry between Batista and Triple H in 2005, a rivalry that really shot Batista to the moon of WWE superstardom. And I guess we'll tie in a bit with their rivalry that took place at the beginning of 2019, leading to Batista's retirement match as well. But I really want to hone in on their initial rivalry coming off of the breakup of Evolution that really, really got the got things going for Batista. And as always, Triple H just playing the great, great heel, which he so often did back in the Ruthless Aggression era. But uh, as always, I want to just give my opinion on the current product, and I guess we'll just start right at the top. Drew McIntyre wins the belt back from Randy Orton in on Monday Night Raw as he will go to Survivor Series to go head-to-head with the Universal Champion Roman Reigns. And look, I'm going to start with the positives here because there are quite a few positives. Number one, Drew back as champion. I didn't want to see him get the belt back quite this fast, but at the same time, Drew McIntyre is the best babyface champion WWE has had since John Cena, so I'm not upset. And I did want Drew McIntyre going into WrestleMania as the WWE champion. So for that, if anybody was going to take it off the red-hot Randy Orton, might as well be Drew McIntyre. Second positive... Drew McIntyre versus Roman Reigns. Everyone is going to be on their edge of their seat watching this match. I don't think there has been two better built superstars in quite some time running parallels on opposite shows than what we've seen with Drew McIntyre on Raw and Roman Reigns on SmackDown. But all that being said, I don't understand why WWE decided to pull the trigger on this quite so fast. Because let's be real here. I know they're trying to build this as like almost a first time ever thing, but these two have squared off before at WrestleMania, no less. They fought at WrestleMania 35, I want to say. And okay, albeit it was kind of a throwaway match, no titles were on the line. Drew McIntyre was the heel, a returning Roman Reigns was babyface coming back from his cancer diagnosis. So I guess you could say that match was kind of a wash, but they have already fought once before. Second thing is, I remember a few months ago or weeks ago at this point, Triple H mentioned that Drew McIntyre versus Roman Reigns could be something like Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair or The Rock versus uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. 
And you know what? That that's all well and true. In I guess if you relate it properly to where wrestling is today, because the fact of the matter is WWE will never be, or professional wrestling as a whole will never be as possible as it once was in the 90s and early, early 2000s. And that's nobody's fault, but ever since it's been kind of common knowledge that wrestling is scripted and it's a show, and everyone doesn't have that, you know, lingering belief of, well, could it be real in some areas? Which, that's what it used to be sometimes in the 90s or the early 2000s when I was growing up watching it. Like, you knew that it was a show, and you knew it was scripted, and you knew it was characters, but because there was no internet, because kayfabe was still such a thing back then, you always had a lingering belief of, well, is it real sometimes? Oh, did he actually get mad and clock him with the chair? But nowadays, everyone knows it's a show. You know, kayfabe is dead, dead for the most part. So just because of that alone, I don't think it is ever going to be, and I'm talking about Drew versus Roman now, I don't think there was ever a true possibility that it could ever be like Rock versus Austin or Hogan versus Flair. But even if you want to say, in terms of wrestling hype today, that's what it would be, which is a fair statement, why are you blowing it off at an exhibition match at Survivor Series which with a weak build? That's what I don't understand. You are making this a, just a one-off match that won't mean anything in the month of November with a build of less than two weeks. And I don't understand what WWE is doing here. I get that there was the report, as Matt brought up from Dave Meltzer, that they didn't feel much was going on in terms of the hype between Roman versus Randy Orton. And obviously, this is a big match that people will want to see. And that's all true. But why are you doing it now? And first, I'll I'll give my opinion about the whole, like, Randy Orton versus Drew Roman Reigns being a nothing match. You're probably right on that, but whose fault is that? It's the fault of WWE yet again going ahead with this Raw versus SmackDown theme for Survivor Series. Which doesn't make sense unless there's a congruent storyline to be told. And when you just make this the pay-per-view theme and you just make matches out of thin air because the calendar flips to November, there will be a lot of matches that feel like nothing matches. Like Sasha Banks versus Asuka. Has anyone really talked about that? I don't think anyone has. I don't think Asuka has referred to Sasha Banks once and vice versa. Is that not going to be a nothing match? Like... The 5-on-5 elimination match, the classic elimination match, I'll give them credit where credit is due. Maybe I'm a bit in the minority here, but I've at least felt a need to care about Team Raw. I think what AJ Styles has done has really drawn my attention. You know, he has a very comedic way about him, and it almost feels like he's straddling the line between Hale and Babyface right now. And yeah, some of the, I guess, beefs in like uh, on team raw right now are somewhat juvenile like the team captain and you know the pushing and shoving and the stupid uh, nicknames by Matt Riddle but by and large they've made me at least care about that team I think that they've done a decent job for a I want to say about three consecutive weeks now with the same five members of making me want to watch the five on five elimination match but over on Smackdown well for one they're still missing a guy You know, we're two days away from the pay-per-view and we're still missing a member for Team SmackDown. Seth Rollins has barely referenced it because he's been enticed again with the Rey Mysterio, Buddy Murphy angle. But at least, thank God, that is done now. You get Baron Corbin, who I haven't seen on television in one or two weeks. You know, like, what? why am I supposed to care about this? Even Kevin Owens, I haven't seen him on television lately. You know, he got he got beat by Jey Uso and he missed last week. So even though the Raw team, that whole angle may be a bit juvenile and childish with the way WWE is pushing forward with it, but at least they're referring and, you know, bringing up the fact that they're going to be fighting at Survivor Series in the near future. On SmackDown, it's like it's not even a thing. Like, the guys have never crossed paths. They don't even know who the fifth partner is. 
they're all too busy in their own internal matches and programs like at least on raw they're at least playing to the fact that they're involved in a match in the near future and that's where i come back to randy orton versus roman reigns well yeah pardon my language but no crap that no but it was going to be a nothing match and you know what like i guess like from a pure match perspective drew versus randy orton is going to be the better match and obviously baby face versus heel will be more intriguing for most of the fans but you could have done something with randy orton versus roman reigns they had a short program in 2014 i want to say randy orton was still part of the authority the the shield had just disbanded and roman reigns was getting pushed very hard right out of the gate but this is just a missed opportunity for me. And I'm not even particularly talking about the Survivor Series pay-per-view because unfortunately it pretty much is just an exhibition pay-per-view. And that's really too bad considering about what Survivor Series used to be as one of the big four pay-per-views a year. And at one time were one of my favorites because I just love the five-on-five matches. But this is a big opportunity because you're wasting Drew versus Roman on an exhibition match. Like I previously said, they've already fought once at a WrestleMania. And maybe you can kind of just brush that under the rug a bit and say, well, you know, Drew wasn't a main eventer. One was heel, one was babyface, and now they're reversed now. No belt was on the line. Roman had just come back and he had a quick opponent. Okay, fine. No problem. But if you actually think that this is a Rock Austin, Hogan Flair type of program, why are you blowing it off in an exhibition match at Survivor Series? And I equated it to this. Remember in 2000 when Steve Austin first came back from his neck injury that kept him on the sidelines from a year ago, uh, for, for a year? Imagine if instead of building him versus Rock of them barely crossing paths for five months upon his return, building them for five months to get to WrestleMania 17 the main event at the Houston Astrodome at what is often regarded as the best WrestleMania card of all time and the greatest main event of all time, Rock vs. Austin WWF Championship. Imagine if, upon Steve Austin's return, he won the belt back at Armageddon and then The Rock and him faced off at, let's say, the Royal Rumble pay-per-view shortly thereafter. Or better yet, what if The Rock kept uh, kept the WWF Championship and never dropped it to Kurt Angle and him and Austin went head-to-head at the Survivor Series right away? Would we be talking about that match 19 years later like we are right now? Or actually 20 years later like we are right now had they had their mega match at a Survivor Series or an Armageddon or even a Royal Rumble? The answer is simple, and it's no. And that's what WWE is doing here. You're taking the two biggest stars in the company right now, and you're pitting them against each other in an exhibition match with a week-long build. And that's what I don't understand. When I get upset about what WWE did here, it isn't even so much that they have this match going on, And it isn't even so much of what they're doing in the here and now. It's what they're wasting in the future. Because when I saw Drew come out on SmackDown, I wasn't a big fan of it because I don't like when they break the brand extension rules. I really like when they just adhere to their own brands. But I almost said to myself, like, okay, you know what? I'll make an exception here. I'll let it pass in my brain because in the long run, this could be huge. And I thought they're going to make Drew win the the Royal Rumble, and cross over to SmackDown, and these two are going to main event WrestleMania. And I got really excited about that because, for one, they would have had Drew win the Royal Rumble for the second time in a row, for the second year in a row, not done since 97, 98, when Stone Cold Steve Austin did that. And I think that would have been really cool because I've said numerous times, Drew is the best babyface champion WWE has had in about six years right now. And making him win the the Rumble two years in a row would automatically cement him as a top babyface of the last two generations. And I really think he has the potential with the way he is trending to cement himself in that kind of company. And second of all, you have these two main event to WrestleMania. And that would have just been perfect. That would have been the perfect 
main event for the upcoming WrestleMania. And I know I had said numerous times I wanted Drew to go back in, into Mania as WWE Champion because of just how good he is. And I still stand by that. But if this was an option to have Drew win the Rumble and cross over to SmackDown to face Roman Reigns, that would have been an even better option. So just the fact that we know that's not going to happen now, or at least highly unlikely that that's going to happen now, it really kind of upsets me. Because you're robbing us of potentially one of the biggest builds to one of the biggest matches in quite some time at a WrestleMania, and you're throwing it away on an exhibition match. And I just, I know why WWE did it. I understand why they did it. I kind of get it. But this is just such a mistake on so many levels. And and it's to say nothing of what they've done with Randy Orton. Because now, Randy Orton, for whenever Edge comes back, it's not going to really feel like a whole lot. Like, okay, Edge is going to come back and get his revenge, and they'll have the rumored I quit match at WrestleMania 37, and everyone will watch, and it will be good. But think about how many times Randy Orton has gotten his in the past couple months. Matt brought it up on the Raw review. He has lost 75% of his matches against Drew McIntyre since the program started in early August. He lost a match to Keith Lee at what payback was it? Just out of nowhere. No pun intended. So all the great heel heat that Randy Orton has built up and all the scumbaggery. I know that's a made up word, but I like to use it when it fits. All the scumbaggery that he has done over the last six or seven months has just kind of been washed away. So now when Edge does make his comeback, which we would assume is coming in the next two or three months here, he's going to go after Randy Orton. And yeah, sure, I'll I'll be intrigued in the program, but Randy Orton will have lost numerous and numerous times since then. So it's not going to feel nearly as big of a deal when Edge does come back and challenges Randy Orton for his revenge for punk kicking him. And look, I just think that they really messed up in a lot of ways here by making Randy Orton drop the belt to Drew on Monday Night Raw, which was a great match, I'll add. Fantastic in-ring performance by both these guys, and I'm not going to take that away from them. But that doesn't change the fact that they really missed the boat here And just another quick thing I want to touch on before we get into rivalries is um, I want to give a bit of my two cents on Retribution here. And I don't want to, you know, waste too much time on them. But is someone telling them to look insane when they come out, like their entrance? And I know that's supposed to be their gimmick, but the whole face grabbing and twitching and shaking their head like they're a dog coming out of the bath... Like, it just feels so forced, does it not? Like, I'm not going to sit here and say that if they didn't do that, it would make their gimmick more credible or believable or light. But at the same time, like, I just don't understand why they're trying to drive so home that these guys are, like, clinically insane. Like, I thought they were just rebels, not clinically insane. Like, they didn't just open up Arkham Asylum and Gotham and let out these guys, did they? I don't know. It's just the the retribution thing. They're they're a gimmick that when it first started, I thought that they had something. And I really thought that they were going to go somewhere pretty big with it. And I love Mustafa Ali. And this is by far his best work of his career. But once they revealed him as the leader, it was almost kind of like, really? that's where the payoff was that like that's what we did all this for and another thing is like they went from like 40 guys to now down to like four with a girl and I just I don't know it's I'm not gonna tear it apart because I feel like we've gotten our fix doing that quite a lot already but it's it's just like what was the whole point of this and they come out with like that the filming as if they were uh, Sanity, the group Sanity that was short-lived with like Killian Dane and Eric Young, and uh, I believe Nikki Cross was part of it too. They have like that filming style when they come out, and they're like shaking their head and just all twitchy and everything. And I know they got the win this week over Team Raw, but 
I just, they gotta just do away with this now. I just, I don't even understand where creative thinks that they could possibly go with this. The only way this type of gimmick was gonna work is if it was like a true type of invasion angle and it was, it had something to do with WWE's head office or whatnot. But now that they're just, you know, just kind of like throwaway guys on a card, like I just, ugh. it's too bad because I still do believe that the, the idea at the root of it was very, very good, but now it's just, it's too far gone, and it's very unfortunate to, to say, but the retribution angle is just way too far gone, and I just think that it's going to go by the wayside, much like the way of Raw Underground, which, to be honest, I preferred more than retribution at this point, because at least it was somewhat original. But enough of like about that. Let's get into the reason you guys are here, and that is for WWE rivalries. And as I previously said, this week is going to be I find a special episode, and this and it is Triple H versus versus Batista. And you may ask, well, why is it special? You've said that quite a few times already. I think it's special because this really kind of put a bow on the ruthless aggression era, in my opinion. Because when I think of Ruthless Aggression Era, it ended on, I would say, 2007. Or in 2007, rather. Sorry, my English isn't so good today, is it? <laughs> but, and you guys may say, well, this culminated in the summer of 2005. Why did, like, why are you saying that it, it put a bow on the Attitude Era? Or the Ruthless Aggression Era if it ended in 2007? It ended that way because at WrestleMania 21... You saw Batista and John Cena walk away with the respective world titles on SmackDown and on Raw. And those two guys effectively held the titles on and off right up until WrestleMania 23 in 2007. And WrestleMania 23 was the culmination of the Ruthless Aggression era. You know, they went PG shortly thereafter. And both Batista and John Cena walked into that WrestleMania as the champions. And that and that whole run and the reign of Cena and Batista from in the mid-2000s started at WrestleMania 21. But the build to WrestleMania 21 was much better than the actual pay-per-view. Because to be honest, aside from Angle versus HBK and even Taker versus uh, Randy Orton, and even this the... Um, what is it, the the first ever Money in the Bank ladder match, I wasn't a huge fan of WrestleMania 21, and I know that may be very much of a hot take or an unpopular opinion, but I don't know, there was something about that WrestleMania that I, I didn't sit right with me, like, there was no tag team matches, that always bothered me, uh, neither tag title was defended on the show, I thought the women's bat- match was very forgettable of uh, Trish versus uh, Christy Hemi, I thought the JBL versus John Cena match was kind of lackluster after the build was very, very well done. But there was just something about WrestleMania 21 that I almost felt robbed when it came and went. Like, that wasn't a true WrestleMania. But that doesn't change the fact that the main event as well was pretty good. And that was Triple H versus Batista. And how this all got started was pretty much back when these guys were in evolution together. And we'll rewind it all the way to SummerSlam 2004 when Randy Orton won the World Heavyweight Championship from Chris Benoit. And you may ask, well, Randy Orton, what does he have to do with Batista and Triple H? Well, because when Randy Orton won the World Heavyweight Championship, this pretty much indirectly started the build for Batista versus Triple H. And the fans didn't know, and WWE didn't know. But when you look back on it, this is where it started. Because an organic love for Batista really started to take place right after Randy Orton disbanded from Evolution. Because as you guys may remember, he won the World Heavyweight Championship. The following night on Raw, he successfully defended it against Chris Benoit. And then in celebration, he goes on Triple H on Batista's shoulders in kind of the position of electric chair. Triple H gives Randy Orton the thumbs up, and then the famous thumbs down points to Batista, and Batista drops Randy Orton on his back, and they lay a beating, that's evolution, on Randy Orton, and basically kick him out of the group. And that turns Randy Orton effectively as a babyface. He has 
About a two-month-long program with Triple H, he quickly dropped the belt back to Triple H at the following pay-per-view at Unforgiven. Triple H gets the strap back yet again after not having it since March when he dropped the belt at WrestleMania. And off we are again with another heel championship run by Triple H. And it was almost kind of confusing at the time because when they first went down this road, it was almost like, okay, well, they're going full steam ahead with Randy Orton as the top babyface on the brand. He's going to go toe-to-toe with Triple H for quite some time here. And I, for one, at least expected him to have a lengthy run, or at least longer than a month, as World Heavyweight Champion. But we didn't see him get that title back for quite some time. And to be honest, he went over to SmackDown before he even got another championship run. And now that I think of it, it took him, I think, another three years to win a world championship after he dropped it to Triple H at Unforgiven 2005. And obviously there's rumors if you watch the Ruthless Aggression documentary that he wasn't ready for it. He was still very juvenile, childish. I just don't think the character fit the bill to be a babyface world champion at that stage or even ever, to be quite honest. Randy Orton is just such a good heel. But when Randy Orton dropped this title and never really got back in the championship picture, he didn't win another world title, that being World Heavyweight or WWE Championship, until I want to say late 2007 because he went over to SmackDown he had the lengthy program with The Undertaker came back over to Raw aligned himself with Edge and went up against Degeneration X you know WrestleMania 23 like I just talked about he was involved in the Money in the Bank ladder match which is not a very usual spot for him being in the first ever in the first match on the card so it was really up until it was really until the end of 2007 early 2008 when Randy Orton got back into that main event status back there as a heel mind you when he won the belt and started fighting with Triple H and whatnot but that's just to say how far off Randy Orton was from being a true top guy in the championship scene when they first pulled the plug on his initial run in the fall of 2005. So with Randy Orton's run as a babyface champion on Raw as a failed experiment, it kind of led to yet another door opening. And we talked about this last week, you know, whenever they didn't have a true uh, dancing partner for Triple H, they always kind of went back to the well with HBK, which they did quite a few times here. Then you had, you know, Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho take their chance at, at Triple H. And eventually Triple H dropped the world heavyweight championship and it was deemed vacated and this led to an elimination chamber match at the new year's resolution pay-per-view and that's a pay-per-view that was kind of short-lived i believe it only took place three years in a row and it was following the new year as the name may tell you and it was the raw pay-per-view right before the royal rumble so with the world heavyweight championship vacated we see a match of Edge, Batista, Randy Orton, Chris Jericho, Chris Benoit, and Triple H with HBK as the special guest referee inside the Elimination Chamber for the vacated World Heavyweight Championship. And this is where I thought that they may have done the turn for Batista to become a babyface world champion. Because like I said... For the for the last four months at this point, Triple H had just been going against kind of like a committee of baby faces on the Raw brand, but didn't have that one true top guy there. And over this time, organically, you had started to feel a general admiration for Batista from the fans. And slowly but surely, Triple H and or WWE rather was starting to hint that they were going to start going down a Batista versus Triple H type of program. And obviously, they were both still heels at the time going forward with the Evolution group, but you started to see kind of chinks in the armor between the relationship of Triple H and Batista. And I remember this started leading up to the Elimination Chamber match where they all had beat the clock challenges and the winner of it would go in last uh, in the chamber or be the last one to go into the match, you know, how they're all in the pods. And Batista won this and Triple H was super pissed off, like, why'd you do this? Now I have to go in early. And 
going into this chamber match, it was pretty much decided within evolution, of course, that Batista would just be the heavy for Triple H inside the chamber and help him retain the World Heavyweight Championship. So he was a member, but not really when you really thought about it. And obviously it came down to Randy Orton, Batista, and Triple H inside the chamber match. And Randy Orton eliminates Batista before Triple H was able to save him and eventually eliminated Randy Orton to win back the World Heavyweight Championship. But as Randy Orton demonstrates on the following number of Raws, is that on the footage you see that Triple H could have saved Batista from Randy Orton's elimination if he had got up out of the corner but then quickly sat back down. So yet another indication that WWE is going to push forward with a Batista versus Triple H type of program. But lo and behold, they stick to their guns leading into the Royal Rumble. The Batista is still right by the side of Triple H. They're going hand in hand with Evolution, uh, the Nature Boy Ric Flair by their side. Triple H successfully defends the World Heavyweight Championship uh, against Randy Orton at Royal Rumble 2005. And Batista wins the Royal Rumble. And this is where things really start to get interesting. Because now Batista, who by this point has the total support of fans. Like you could just hear that the crowd absolutely adored Batista in this moment. And it was so cool to watch because it was such an organic backing behind Batista. Especially when you saw them not really get behind Randy Orton, who was almost like the chosen, the chosen one and the hand-picked guy by the WWE creative and management. But now you get Batista, who they just organically got behind, WWE recognized what was happening, and started to push him. So following the Royal Rumble, we start to see on Monday Night Raw that Triple H and Ric Flair are lobbying for Batista to go to SmackDown face JBL for the for the WWE championship and that way you know the evolution would be the world champ on both brands and to be honest it wasn't completely out of the question because just one year prior Benoit a Smackdown competitor had jumped to Raw following his Royal Rumble championship win to challenge Triple H at WrestleMania 20 so even though you really didn't think it was going to happen, you had to at least entertain the possibility that, oh yeah, maybe they will send Batista over to Raw to fight JBL for the championship, and maybe they do Randy Orton versus Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship. Like, it wasn't completely out of the question that that's the avenue that WWE would go down here. But on the night where Batista had to pick what brand he was going to decide on, and what title he was going to fight for at WrestleMania 21, he hears Triple H admitting to Ric Flair that he staged a setup trying to frame John Bradshaw Layfield. And this is a famous scene backstage where Triple H is talking to Ric Flair in the locker room, the camera pans out, and Batista is listening just on the other side of the wall, kind of snickering. Because the the week or two prior, we had seen JBL's limo peel out of the raw parking lot after attacking Batista. And this was eventually revealed to be a Triple H mock limo that he admitted to on this raw that Batista had just heard him talk about. So as they all come to the ring and Teddy Long's over from SmackDown with the SmackDown contract for the WWE Championship, Bischoff is in there with the Raw contract for the World Heavyweight Championship, we finally get to hear the decision of Batista in front of everyone and Evolution. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the world. You and I to walk that aisle with the Nature Boy Ric Flair side by side owning this business doesn't seem like a difficult decision to me at all, Dave. It really doesn't. And I've got a feeling you know what you want to do, big man, don't you? You know what you want to do. Hunter, 
I've known what I was going to do for a long time. here on Raw. And on WrestleMania, I'm taking the World Championship. So as you heard, just when Triple H had finished his lobbying for Triple uh, for Batista rather to go over to SmackDown, stand side by side as both world champions in WWE, he gives the thumbs down to Triple H and Ric Flair, beats the hell out of both of them, and gives Triple H, which may be the most vicious power bomb I've ever seen, through the um, I guess the table that was set up to sign the contract, and this kind of reveals why it. Their, this program started back in the summer following SummerSlam when they turned on Randy Orton because of the thumbs down. And that became a whole part of Batista's gimmick for the rest of his career. Before he would hit the Batista bomb, he would go thumbs up, thumbs down, and then hit it. But this stemmed from Triple H doing that to Randy Orton all the way back in August of 2004, and this was the first time we saw Trip- Batista do it to Triple H, which, like I just said, became a big part of his character, and a specifically a big part of the- this program. So they go on to WrestleMania 21, and Batista wins the World Heavyweight Championship, closing out the show. And we have a new era of of uh, in on Monday Night Raw. And like I said... It had been, I would say, three years running at this point where Triple H was the World Heavyweight Champion on and off in WWE, aside from a few brief runs here and there from, let's say, a five-month run from Chris Benoit or a month-long reign by HBK or a three-month run by Goldberg, a month-long run by Randy Orton. But you put that all together and it equates to maybe a year so for two out of the three fall, uh, past years, Triple H had been the world heavyweight champion. And when Batista won it, it felt like it was different as opposed to the others. Because, well, maybe not Randy Orton, but he lost it so quickly that it kind of just fell flat. But when it came to HBK or Chris Benoit or the Goldberg, like those guys weren't the future. They had already done a lot of what they had to do in their careers. But when Batista won it, 
you really felt that, okay, this is going to be the guy for quite some time here on Monday Night Raw. And eventually he switched over to SmackDown, but you get the point. He was the face of that World Heavyweight Championship for the following two or three years after this. So they have their rematch at at uh, Backlash, which Batista wins and retains his championship. And following their match at Backlash, we really got the impression that this program was over when Triple H came to the ring the following night. You need me a whole lot more than I need you. I am the measuring stick of this business to which everybody is compared. And I will justify what you think you've become in this business. I define who you are, and I will define who you become. So, so if, if, if you think you're going to mess with me, huh? is that, that what you think? You think that's going to be your big thing? Screw you, Triple H, right? Well, let me smarten everybody up to one thing. It's never going to be screw me. It's going to be screw you. You want to mess with me? Fine. I'll walk out that door. What? I'll pack my bag. I'll walk out. Wait a minute. What's he saying here? Don't think I'll do it? Huh? Is that what you think? You don't think I'll do it? I'll do it in a second. I will grab my stuff. I will walk out that door. I will sit on the couch in my big mansion. And you know what I'll watch? I'll watch you fail. I'll watch you fall apart. I will watch you fall off the mountain just like everybody else. And then when you're done, the whole world, every single one of them, will come crawling back to me, begging, begging, begging for me to come back. Think I won't do it? Huh? Wait, wait, you know wait. what? No. No. Screw you. No, don't do it, Triple H. JR! So Triple H walks out on, on Monday Night Raw following Backlash, basically saying that Batista is nothing without him. And to be quite honest... Well, first and foremost, how well can Triple H cut a promo? And he is just the best heel of all time. I'll just come out and say it. When Triple H was in this mode and in this groove back in 2005, there was no one that could touch him as a main event heel in WWE. And what he was saying was pretty much true. He was the measuring stick. A lot of guys needed Triple H to get over as legitimate stars. So while he was a full-blown heel and he was cutting that promo and you know, Batista just beat him in back-to-back matches, so you really couldn't have, like, an argument to back Triple H. At the same time, he was saying the truth. Like, he had carried that company, or the Raw brand specifically, on his back for the last three years at this point. So, when the crowd was booing him, and Batista acted so much better than him, and during this whole pro- this whole, um, this whole whole promo, Batista was kind of snickering in his face, Just a really well done promo to make you realize what Triple H believed of himself. And if you looked at it objectively, which was pretty much true. So we don't see Triple H for quite some time at this point. You really truly believe that his program with Batista is done. I personally thought that we we weren't going to see Triple H until around SummerSlam. Because it had been quite some time since he had took a lengthy leave of absence at this point. And he had always been a staple at the top of Monday Night Raw for like three years running. 
And while he is gone in his absence, we start to see that Batista starts rekindling his relationship with Ric Flair. And while he's rekindling his relationship with Ric Flair, you really start to believe like, okay, so now Ric Flair may be turning babyface, and well, his beef was never with Batista, it was Triple H's. So with Ric Flair and Batista ba- seemingly back on the same page now, it results in a match on Raw, which which Ric Flair helps Batista get the win on. And then following the match, Triple H's music hits, he comes out with a sledgehammer, and while Batista is distracted, look up the ramp, Ric Flair hits him with a low blow, turning on him yet again, once again being the dirtiest player in the game, and setting up the stage for Triple H to come out and beat the holy hell of Batista with a sledgehammer. And this leads to the final chapter of their 2005 rivalry at Vengeance, where they are booked to go inside hell in a cell, and this is how they got there. Raw has been about one man, Triple H. This is evolution. My thought, my heart, my sweat, my blood make this what it is today. Triple H has made you special. When he's ready to step down, you be the man. When I won Royal Rumble, Batista will be the winner of it at WrestleMania 21. It was still all about. Triple H, I gave you guidance, I gave you direction, and I made you the animal that I see standing in this ring today. I had to make a decision. Go to SmackDown and leave Raw on the Triple H. Sometimes Dave is not smart enough to know what's good for him. And what's right for Batista is for him to go to SmackDown. I'm staying right here on Raw. Not WrestleMania. I'm taking the world championship from you. The beast has been unleashed. Batista is the new heavyweight champion of the world. If you think this is the start of the Batista era, you are wrong because the rematch clause is rock solid. Oh, the Batista Maybe you're just not good enough to face me again. You want to mess with me? Fine. I'll walk out that door. Screw you. Triple H got the limousine draw off the property. He quit a rock. Because of you. I'm saying many times, man. I have nothing but respect for you. But you're wrong. This is not my fault. It's Triple H's fault. Face to face. 
So there you have it. The build, which pretty much gave me goosebumps, not going to lie, guys. But the build to their final match at Vengeance 2005 inside Hell in a Cell. And you have to remember that to this point, Triple H had never lost a one-on-one match inside Hell in a Cell. And leading up to this, you know, he had beaten the likes of HBK, Mick Foley, Kevin Nash, all inside Hell in a Cell. So this was a match that was heavily skewed in the favor going in for Triple H. Batista ends up getting the win, completing the trifecta of victories over Triple H, and closing the book on their rivalry in 2005. And the next, or the following SmackDown after this pay-per-view, he actually got drafted to SmackDown. And that's what really separated these guys for quite a few years following. And then... Well, obviously, Batista returned in 2019, attacked uh, Ric Flair, and then they had their no-holds-barred match at WrestleMania 35, which culminated with Triple H beating him in Batista's retirement match. Because the whole build to that paper, or to that match, rather, was the fact that Triple H had never beaten Batista one-on-one, which was true to that point. So all in all, I just think that this was a very good rivalry, a very important rivalry, because it set the stage for one of the faces of their company for the following five years in Batista. He cemented himself as almost like Bat- as Triple H's kryptonite for <laughs> the, what, 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 what do you want to say, the succeeding 14 years after this program, as it took Triple H 14 years to finally get the one-on-one victory over Batista at WrestleMania 35. And retiring him in doing so. And I and it just kind of ended a reign of terror, for lack of a better words, of Triple H over Monday Night Raw. And I don't hold it against Triple H because up until this point there wasn't a formidable guy to take over the baton and run with it as that world heavyweight champion. But by this point, I think the fans had kind of gotten exhausted as Triple H constantly being world heavyweight champion night in night out even if he lost it for a few months you knew he was getting it back so i think by this point batista was the perfect guy at the right time to take that belt from triple h and lead it into the next generation but of course batista took it over to smackdown which is where the world heavyweight championship stayed until it was merged with the wwe championship in 2014 i want to say So anyway, guys, that's all I got for you this week. As always, you can get me on Twitter at adamarco25. You can email Matt at RealWWEPodcast. You can leave him a voicemail, which I know a lot of you guys have. As always, feel free to leave me with some questions if you may have some. And until then, I'll talk to you next time.